Honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished representatives, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are to all of you, and a warm welcome um, from a um, sunny New York morning to this final session of the Africa Regional um, uh, Review uh, Meeting. Um, my name is Hades Cruderis Fox, and I'm the director of the UN Office of uh, for the high representative of least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states. And it's my great honor and pleasure to moderate this final session on building climate resilience and accelerating the energy transitions in African LDCs. And before we go into the substance of our discussions today, and in order to help our meeting to run as smoothly as possible in this virtual format, let me share with you a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first, if you are speaking during the session, please keep your video on and your microphone muted while you are not speaking. And if you are not speaking during this session, you should uh, uh, preferably keep your microphone muted and video off um, during the meeting. If you are a speaker, in order to ensure everyone has a chance to speak, please keep the time allotted and wrap up if the chair requests uh, for you to do so. And please feel free to engage in the chat, but if you have specific questions uh, that you would like to be uh, uh, reviewed for the response uh, by the panelists, please ask them in the Q&A section. This session will discuss the factors affecting the high degree of vulnerability faced by the African LDCs it will explore how adaptation to climate change and disaster resilience efforts relate to the sustainable development of African LDCs and the mechanisms and approaches that could contribute to resilience building. The discussion will focus on ending poverty in LDCs and the important role that clean and renewable energy plays in building climate resilient development pathways. It will also explore workable solutions and concrete actions that could contribute to a better anchoring of resilience and sustainability issues as part of the new program of action for the LDCs. In particular, this session will address the following five issues. Number one, discuss the ongoing trends in integrating climate ambition and energy transition into resilience planning in African LDCs. Two, explore the current climate uh, finance landscape and recent efforts to increase access to climate finance for LDCs. Three, discuss ways to bridge the energy access gap while simultaneously supporting the implementation of national climate ambition. Four, consider the role of renewable energy in the context of COVID-19 and building back better. And finally, five, identify challenges that need further consideration and strength and coordination by the international community for resilience building in African LDCs. This session will include a panel of speakers, very distinguished panel of speakers, uh, followed by an interactive uh, segment with interventions by the lead discussion. During the interactive segment, the audience can ask the panelists questions and comment on their presentations. So please write the Q&A chat function. Um, please write in the Q&A function if you wish to take the floor. So with this short introduction, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce the distinguished panelists. First, we will have the Honorable Newton Kambala, Minister of Energy of Malawi. Honorable Minister, very warm welcome. Then uh, followed by Mr. Francesco La Camera, who is the Director General of the International Renewable Energy um, Agency, IRENA. We will very warm welcome to you, Mr. La Camera. Uh, Mr. Mustafa uh, Bakuri, President and CEO of the Moroccan Agency for Sustainable Energy and co-lead for the Coalition of Sustainable Energy Access. A very warm welcome to you. Mr. Eric Wanless, Director of Technology and Innovation, Power and Climate Initiative of the Rockefeller Foundation. Very nice to see you, Eric, warm welcome. 
Ms. Uh, Cecilia Nienga, uh, Head of South African Office of UNEP, very warm welcome. And Mr. Anjad Abashar, who is the head of UNDRR's regional office for Africa. Very warm welcome to you as well. So now uh, we will start our discussions and it's my great honor and pleasure to invite the Honorable Newton Kambala, Minister of Energy of Malawi and Mr. Minister, if I may, I would like to um, ask you a question. Uh, that uh, we would really like to hear uh, your views on. What are the main challenges faced in the deployment of renewable energy in Malawi? What policy and programmatic interventions are needed to increase access to clean and affordable energy for all by 2030? Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Moderator. Um, let me start by uh, recognizing uh, the presence of uh, uh, Francesco Lapamea, uh, Director General, um, Mustaf uh, Bakare, President and CEO of Morocco Agency, Eric Wenrese, uh, Director of Technology and Innovation, Power and Climate in, uh, Initiative, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Cecilia Yenga, uh, Head of South African Office, UNEP, and uh, Abasha, Head of UNDDR Regional Office uh, for Africa. Um, the challenges uh, faced in a development Deployment of renewable energy in Malawi, uh, quite many, but I will mention a few. Uh, one of the challenges is high initial costs, which are not affordable by many in Malawi. Renewable energy dissemination is affected by the high initial costs, especially for projects requiring energy storage. The second one is uh, generally uh, there is a lack of local capacity in manufacturing, distribution, installation, and maintenance of renewable energy technologies. Uh, number three, there's lack of information on FPAS of renewable energy technologies in Malawi. And then uh, four, uh, limited access to financing. Uh, the money market is not well developed in general to take upon risks associated with investing and in particular the energy sector uh, which is perceived to be riskier. As such, access to finance by uh, prospective developers remain a big challenge. There's also lack of dedicated financing mechanism and uh, limited delivery models. And then number five, influx, uh, in, in, an influx of substandard products is also causing a huge project, uh, a problem in Malawi. Uh, the influx of substandard sub products is, is, is a discouragement to new and future users of renewable energy products. And the country has inadequate capacity to screen out substandard products. We've got a Bureau of Standards, which has the standards, but lacks testing equipment to enforce the required standards. Finally, um, but not least, inadequate institutional capacity in higher learning institutions on renewable energy technologies. There is a deficiency in human capital with skills that are critical to renewable energy promotion, which is emanating from both the adequacy and quality of the training uh, coming from the country's higher learning institutions. And then there's awareness. Uh, there's a general lack of awareness on the possibilities of using renewable energy uh, resources to meet their energy needs, particularly for standalone solar systems. Socially also, there is uh, gender insensitivity in the promotion of 
renewable energy. And uh, your second question is talking about the policies uh, that are uh, put in place. The policy direction of the country uh, for renewable energy deployment adequate, adequately takes care of the areas that Malawi is facing uh, as challenges in. We are moving towards implementation of the policies in financial incentives and the uh, capacity building of the Malawi Bureau of Standards and Higher Learning Institutions. Uh, then operationalization of regulatory frameworks and then public awareness as a uh, policies. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Minister, for that very important intervention and, and describing the kinds of challenges that Malawi is facing uh, when you are considering your options for renewable energy, really uh, ranging from the challenges of, of the technical facility, uh, the lack of local capacity and skills, the lack of information, the access uh, to finance and, uh, and others, and also really uh, discussing uh, the, the kind of policy measures uh, that your government is considering in order to, uh, to better um, uh, provide opportunities for uh, renewable energy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. Um, now it is my great uh, pleasure to invite Mr. Francesco La Camera, director of IRENA, uh, to uh, uh, to take the floor and uh, Mr. De La Camera, additional power generation capacity is needed to increase access to energy for African LDCs. Uh, so my questions to you would be, how can it be ensured this additional capacity will mainly utilize renewable energy? And then uh, what is the role of renewables in COVID-19 uh, recovery plans and response and how can it help LDCs to simultaneously increase their climate ambition and accelerate uh, energy transition. Mr. La Camera, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Minister, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to contribute to this important meeting today. I'd like to express my appreciation to the United Nations Office of the I representative for the least developed country, landlocked developed country, and small island development states for its continued efforts in moving the agenda of the Istanbul Program of Action forward. And UNECA, the government of the Republic of Malawi for court organizing and host this meeting. To answer the questions, I'd like the essential need to consider the short-term response to the pandemic with the medium and long-term objective of the Sustainable Development Goal and the Paris Agreement. This is a message that we've been emphasizing at ARENA from the beginning of the pandemic, already one year ago, and we charted the way forward in our post-COVID recovery report. Even before the pandemic, we were not on track toward achieving SDG 7. The world's access deficit is still increasingly concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, where more than half of the population lack access. In addition, millions of people only have minimal and unreliable electricity access. Without more urgent action, more than 620 million people globally will still be left without access to electricity in 2030, and 85% of them living in sub-Saharan Africa. The pandemic could further derail advances made unless we ensure sustainably, sustainable energy is an integral part of the global response. Energy is key to achieving most of the SDG and to achieving the priority area of the Istanbul program of action. By placing energy transition at the center of national recovery plan, African LDC can pave way 
or increase it, socioeconomic res release, uh, re resilience that include reliable energy access, resilient livelihoods, and long-term social security. Africa is endowed with immense renewable clean energy resources. Renewable energy can be a game changer in, Africa, in Africa's development path. They are cost competitive, fast to deploy, support energy independence and security while reducing dependence on imported fuel. They can provide timely access to clean electricity that protects health and the environment. And renewables can do so while creating millions of new jobs, stimulating industrial development along the value chains and shaping a different future for Africa youth. With over 60 of its population younger than 25 years old, now more than ever, the African view requires jobs and opportunity. For every one million US dollar invested in renewable energy, 25 jobs are being created. For Africa, our estimations show that energy transition related investment focused on renewables efficiency and infrastructure will get more jobs in the continent than in the rest of the world. Overall, renewable can provide a foundation for resilient economies and society as the effects of climate change intensify. African LADCs cannot achieve this transformation on their own. Coordinated effort from the global community and all of us will underpin efforts to close the access gap. ARENA is collaborating with UNDP and NDC partnership to support countries enhance and implement their national determined contributions. We are working with several African NDCs, including Benin, Chad, Gambia, Liberia, Mali, Mozambique, Niger, Rwanda, Uganda, and Zambia. We are working with Burkina Faso to access electric electrifying primary health care facilities as a part of the country's effort to support the overburdened health sector. The work is currently being expanded to several other countries as well. We know that access to financing, as has been just said by the minister, is a big barrier in scaling up renewables in LDCs. Through the Climate Investment Platform, we are facilitating the creation of a pipeline of bankable projects. So far in Africa, 97 projects worth over 38 billion have been registered and 198 private and public partners have expressed their interest in collaborating in this region. ARENA is closely collaborating with Mazen, as well as to explore synergy for the implementation of the activities under the Sustainable Energy Access Coalition. And recently we joined hand with Rockefeller Foundation to promote and work together on closing the gap of access to energy in Africa. Our collaboration will address key challenges hindering energy access, including access to finance. In addition, we are very pleased to be working with the UNO HRLLES on a joint report on scaling up renewable energy in LDCs, with, which will inform the next year LDC conference in Qatar, as well as the next 10 years program of action. The report will include recommendations and action on how to build a renewable-based and resilient energy system, close the energy access gap, and harness the associate socioeconomic and the environmental benefits. ARENA, with its global membership, remains deeply committed to the African LDC agenda. I, we look forward to working with you with determination to leave no one behind and ensure a just sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. La Camera, um, uh, for, for the very important presentation and, and, and really linking that the short term COVID response needs to be in line with the medium and long term uh, uh, 
measures to serve the goals, including the climate goals that we are all uh, very much focused on. And, and also uh, mentioning that energy really is a key factor when we are looking at uh, most all of the SDGs and, and, and how to um, you know, reach those targets. Um, also, it's very important what you have mentioned, linking uh, energy uh, uh, to the, the youth and the possibilities of, of uh, uh, creating employment for the youth, uh, which is a key factor as we are looking into the new program of action and what are the important uh, issues. And also, thank you for Irene's important work in so many of the LDCs, uh, and we, uh, we, uh, we really need more of that more of that so thank you very much for your um, intervention now it's my great pleasure to invite uh, mr mustafa bakuri who is the president and ceo of moroccan agency for sustainable energy and and the co-lead uh, for coalition uh, for sustainable energy access the, co the coalition project announced during the sg's climate summit um, aims to responding uh, to the vital energy needs especially that of ldc's um, so my question to you is what progress has been made in the operationalization of the coalition and will it leverage partnerships and South-South cooperation to contribute the capacity building in the energy sector uh, in LDCs? Mr. Bakuri, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup. Je, je remercie Madame la Modératrice. Chère Ministre, euh, Excellence, Chers collègues et, et invités en vos grades et, et qualités, c'est un, un immense plaisir de me retrouver parmi vous. Et, et, et je voudrais à ce titre aborder deux sujets qui, qui me sont très chers, à savoir la transition énergétique et la coopération sud-sud. Et, et j'aimerais tout d'abord revenir sur la crise résultant de la pandémie actuelle que, que nous continuons de vivre. La COVID-19 est, est, est un fléau qui affecte chaque jour des populations déjà vulnérables à travers le monde, et particulièrement dans les pays les moins avancés. D'après un des rapports de la Conférence des Nations Unies sur le commerce et le développement, la CNUSED, euh, pas moins de 32 millions de, de personnes de plus pourraient basculer dans l'extrême pauvreté dans les PMA. Évidemment, ce chiffre pourrait même euh, augmenter euh, si les perspectives de sortie de cette crise devaient se dégrader davantage. Euh, et, et ceci réduit euh, ainsi des années de progrès déjà laborieux. Cette crise participe également à l'accroissement de leur surendettement, euh, rendant l'accès au financement encore plus difficile pour les, les PMA qui ont pourtant grandement besoin de, de, de soutien financier, et, et particulièrement pour accéder à la, accélérer la dynamique de développement de l'accès à l'énergie, un secteur, comme nous savons tous, euh, qui constitue l'un des piliers de tout programme de développement, car euh, il se trouve au carrefour de tous les secteurs socio-économiques. Il est donc impératif de trouver des solutions pour faire face à cette situation. Et à ce titre, il est important d'initier un programme qui doit être ambitieux pour accompagner les PMA, les LDCs, mais aussi les, les autres pays en, en développement, les ODCs, à structurer des projets bancables qui répondent aux meilleurs standards et qui, euh, sur la base des, des, des meilleures pratiques, et qui, qui ont déjà fait leur preuve ailleurs. Et, et heureusement, dans, dans ce secteur de l'énergie, en particulier de l'énergie durable, les exemples de réussite sont, sont assez nombreux euh, pour euh, améliorer l'attractivité pour les investissements et les financements dont ils ont euh, tant besoin. C'est dans ce sens que, sous la, au Comaroc, sous la conduite de Sa Majesté le Roi Mohamed VI, euh, pour l'implémentation d'une approche de développement durable soucieuse de la préservation de notre euh, environnement, et dans le cadre d'une coopération sud-sud renforcée, le Maroc a pris l'initiative d'asseoir une politique de dialogue et de coopération contribuant positivement aux efforts de la communauté internationale en faveur de l'accès à une énergie propre et durable pour tous. Cet engagement s'est traduit notamment par le lancement avec l'Éthiopie de la coalition lors du sommet euh, onusien Action pour le climat à New York, de la coalition pour l'énergie durable. Euh, en faveur des PMA et autres pays en développement. 
Et à cet égard, la Coalition pour l'accès durable à l'énergie entend faciliter la liaison entre les initiatives et institutions existantes, qui est d'ailleurs l'occasion de coopérer avec certaines institutions présentes ici. Je voudrais saluer Irena et Francesco, et saluer aussi SE for All et les organisations émanant de, 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 de l'ONU. Et la coalition leur fournira donc à ces pays l'accompagnement nécessaire pour mobiliser les institutions partenaires et accélérer l'implémentation des projets d'accès à l'énergie. Par ailleurs, puisque nous pensons que les meilleures pratiques peuvent être tirées des expériences de certains pays du Sud, les plus avancés, la coopération Sud-Sud figure parmi les principes clés fondateurs de cette coalition. D'ailleurs, un centre d'expertise principal sera mis en place pour favoriser les échanges techniques entre les pays du Sud. Aussi, des événements de haut niveau abriteront également des séances d'échange entre les pays du Sud afin de favoriser le partage d'expériences et des meilleures pratiques. Enfin, fort de notre expérience réussie dans les énergies renouvelables, nous avons la ferme conviction que l'innovation et les technologies nouvelles sont également des aspects primordiaux pour faire, face, pour faire de cette dynamique un nouveau levier de développement économique et industriel des pays du Sud. Dans ce sens, la coalition avec le soutien de l'UNIDO travaillera à renforcer le développement de l'innovation et l'intégration industrielle dans les pays du Sud. Cette thématique étant d'ailleurs d'une importance majeure pour nous, pays du Sud, en quête de nouveaux leviers de développement industriel, j'ai le plaisir de vous annoncer que le Maroc a été désigné depuis quelques jours champion mondial du thème « Innovation, technologie et données » dans le cadre du dialogue onusien de haut niveau sur l'énergie en 2021. Nous sommes donc fortement engagés à réaliser la promesse onusienne de l'agenda 2030, « Leave no one behind ». Et pour encadrer toute cette démarche, nous avons également entrepris la définition d'une feuille de route avec le PNUT, comprenant les différentes actions concrètes nécessaires à l'opérationnalisation de ce projet. Ce plan est en cours de finalisation et sera examiné dans un avenir proche par le comité consultatif de la coalition qui, ont, qui, qui, qui est composé de plusieurs institutions, dont d'ailleurs IRENA, ICI for All, et, et, et l'ONU et, 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 et les pays concernés, les pays des régions concernées par, par, par ce programme. Et, et je dois pour finir dire qu'avec euh, votre soutien, avec votre mobilisation, notre mobilisation à tous, pour une approche plus juste et inclusive des PMA et des pays en développement, je crois que nous pourrons construire un, un futur plus sûr, plus équitable et j'espère le plus durable possible. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bakurio, of that excellent uh, presentation. And you very much, like Mr. Lacamara, also uh, enforce the message that energy is really in the crossroads of all the different uh, development efforts and important for, for all the, the efforts that we are doing. And uh, thank you also for your commitment and of the commitment of the coalition to clean energy and the work that you are doing in so many of the African LDCs at the moment. Uh, I take note of the, the work also uh, putting forward these um, ideas of lessons learned uh, uh, um, and also in the context of the South-South cooperation, which I think is very relevant uh, to many of the, of the LDCs. Thank you very much. Um, next, it's my great um, pleasure to invite Mr. Eric Warnless, Director of Technology and Innovation, Power and Climate Initiative of, of Rockefeller uh, uh, Foundation. Um, Eric, as you know, many LDCs have not been able to benefit significantly from the new technologies and the falling costs in renewables to bridge their um, energy access gaps. So what are the key technical, financial and social challenges to develop sustainable energy system in currently underserved areas within the African LDCs and how, uh, in your opinion, can these be overcome? The floor is yours. Thank you and, and uh, uh, thank you distinguished guests for, for sharing the, the, the time with me and, and thank you Director uh, Scudderos Fox for, for moderating. I, I wanna start by saying I, I, I sincerely wish I was in Malawi and we were all in Malawi for this, the warm heart of Africa it has a, a special place in my own heart and uh, hope hope to, to see everyone there uh, in, the, in the coming year. 
Uh, I want to start by saying that the, the foundation has made an unprecedented uh, billion dollar commitment to green and equi equitable recovery, uh, largely in response to COVID-19, but also to meet the moment that we were at. Um, much of this is going to be focused on the development and investment uh, in distributed renewable energy in collaboration with key partners such as IRENA, uh, and also very focused on, on countries like Malawi. Uh, and in very general terms, there are three elements of, of what we're trying to do with partners. The, the first is uh, really country-driven work to create the enabling environment and identify DRE investments, uh, similar to some of the work that has already been happening, uh, again, in, in countries like Malawi. Uh, another part of the, the work will be focused on transactions and innovation to drive down the cost. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth. And then there's a piece around data knowledge and advocacy to really increase the visibility um, and uh, uh, understanding of, of DRE and the role that they can play, distributed renewable energies in, in, in driving economic development. So uh, part of the, the, the response and sort of how we, we, we drive investment of renewables and specifically distributed renewable energy is we need to make sure that they are the least cost, most reliable, and most resilient generation. And the good news is that they're already there in, in many places of the world. So on, on the cost front, really driven by the, the uh, cost declines of, of battery storage, 90% over the last 10 years, and similar declines in solar uh, photovoltaic, uh, there, there's some really transformational things that are happening. And for example, as a result of those cost declines today in the United States, where uh, there's some of the very cheapest uh, and fully developed coal and natural gas resources in the world, it is now cheaper to build new generation assets that leverage a combination of renewables, uh, demand response, energy storage, and energy efficiency than building new coal and gas generation. And in less than two years, it is going to be cheaper to build new resources based on renewable systems than to operate existing fossil resources. So we're already there on the cost front. On the reliability front, uh, a system built on distributed renewable energy is inherently more reliable than a traditionalized thermal system for a, a lot of uh, technical reasons. But just anecdotally, if you look at the, the solutions that are being developed in places like Nigeria, where we have distributed renewable energy supporting the grid uh, uh, and, and showing improvement there, or if we look at the, the things that happened in, in Texas, again, in the United States a few weeks ago, those sorts of things are, are, are mitigated by distributed renewable energy. On resilience, the, uh, for the same reasons as reliability, distributed renewable energy is, is, is the, the technology or set of technologies. And if you take Malawi, for example, um, you know, there, of course, there's uh, Ida, but also if you look at the, the generation mix in Malawi, it, uh, the country is, is very, very dependent on the Shiri River. Uh, and so there's an opportunity to transform the system from reliance on central uh, resources that are concentrated on, on specific technologies to be much more diverse and robust. So we are there in, on the, the cost, reliability, and, and resilience, and, and we just need to make sure that the, the benefits and the disruptions show up in um, uh, LDCs. And so part of what the foundation is, is, is doing to, to address that and, and, and sort of address some of the barriers that we see, it's really about uh, bringing scale, capital, uh, and understanding uh, to, to the place. And so we, we have an effort underway to transform uh, 10,100 kilowatt systems and help them appear as one one gigawatt project with all the finance the, the low cost and, and regulatory uh, regimes that accompany large utility scale efforts. And so it's really about how do we create standardization? How do we aggregate those projects? And how do we, again, make sure that we have these distributed projects and all the benefits and, and cost reductions that they, uh, they have show up in, in LDCs? And that's core to what the foundation is trying to do with, with again, partners such as IRENA and, and with countries like Malawi. So I'll stop there. You, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eric Vanlist, for that uh, excellent presentation of, of the work that Rockefeller Foundation is doing in this field, which is a lot, and I know we have uh, worked closely together with you in the past as well. But uh, what I, when I'm listening to you and I listen to what the uh, Minister of Malawi discussed in the beginning uh, of this, and, and putting in what the, the challenges for the country uh, such as Malawi are, I think that the, the points that you have made on, on bringing scale 
bringing capital and, and uh, be bringing the uh, understanding and the technical know-how uh, to the uh, picture is really the answer of, of what the challenges uh, that he has uh, described for the country are. So thank you again for, um, I think scaling up all of these efforts is a really important part. So thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, presentation and, and for the work that Rockefell Foundation does in, in many of these issues. Now it's my great uh, pleasure um, to invite uh, Ms. Cecilia Nyenga, who is the head of South Africa office of, the, uh, of UNEP. Um, uh, uh, so for you, um, we know what policy interventions uh, do you think are required to meet the adaptation challenges to climate change facing Africa over the next decade? We are looking at the new program of action for the next decade. And what are the barriers and enablers to accessing adaptation funding for enhancing resilience? Um, so, uh, Ms. Nyenga, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Heidi, and thank you very much, uh, Honourable Ministers and my colleagues in the in development sector uh, for giving UNEP an opportunity uh, to participate uh, in this very distinguished panel. Um, I'd like to start my presentation uh, by sharing with you an African proverb. And he whose house is burnt down knows why uh, the ashes uh, are a fortune. And this African proverb aptly personifies Africa's predicament and offers uh, you know, the understanding of the changing climate. It's a key to a house on fire. Um, and whenever a house is burning, several factors come into play. First, the owners try to put out the fire as fast as they can using the tools and resources that are available to them. And secondly, as they try to put out the fire, they try to identify the risk to ensure that that risk is reduced or eliminated altogether. And thirdly, inaction is never an option as we stand to lose everything uh, that we have put in place. Um, you know, as I speak to the question I have, I want to highlight a couple of, uh, of, of issues that, you know, today we are facing a global climate emergency. And even though Africa is home to a majority of LDCs, our contribution to is, as, is very little to global warming. But the continent is disproportionately vulnerable to the impact of climate change. And given our geographical position, this continent is particularly vulnerable due to the considerably limited adaptive capacity uh, that we continue to experience. And moreover, it's exacerbated uh, by the interaction of multiple biophysical, political, and socioeconomic stress factors. And of course, widespread poverty across the continent. Climate change is particularly a threat to our continued economic growth of Africa and to the livelihoods of vulnerable people, both in the rural areas, in urban inf informal settlements, and in the small island uh, states across the continent. Uh, to date, what we are seeing is that climate is really impacting on our GDP. I'll not quote the statistics. I have them on the screen for you. Uh, and assuming that our international efforts uh, keep warm, uh, global warming below the two degrees centigrade, uh, the continent could still face climate, would still require climate change adaptation uh, costs that will exceed at least 50 billion by the year 2050. So we really have uh, quite a lot uh, on our plate as an African continent. I'd also like to really not go through uh, various slides, but also to highlight um, that what would be required is a socioeconomic growth and an economic growth that would contribute uh, to at least the creation of at least 75,000 jobs uh, and 50,000 of all these jobs could be derived and generated from transitions to a green, uh, uh, from a green uh, economy. Africa, the lives and livelihoods, we know that the COVID-19 epidemic has also been a major, uh, you know, emergency uh, of cost, exacerbating the already continued uh, challenge that we are facing as an African continent. 
But I just wanted to highlight what UNEP's contribution uh, has been in this space. And every year we do produce what we call the emissions gap report, uh, basically looking at how do we support uh, member states uh, to supporting their ambition to a much more zero emissions uh, economy and basically looking at technologies and technological innovation that can drive uh, towards uh, this realization. Of course, focusing a lot on the reducing fossil fuel subsidies, and of course, looking at uh, an end uh, to opening up new coal plants across the continent. And more importantly for us here in the Africa continent is looking at nature-based solutions. And particularly because we are a continent that derives a lot of our economy and our livelihood uh, from nature and from our soils, agriculture, restoring landscapes, and also working on uh, reforestation. I'd like to look at uh, some of the findings of the 2020 Global Emissions Report. And again, as you will see from this report, uh, energy uh, sits very centrally uh, in terms of where we would position Africa if we were to transition. And the key sectors are basically energy, uh, looking at industry, agriculture and food, forests and land use, transport and buildings and cities have, have been very much at the heart of where we would require strong green policies uh, that would really set Africa on a pathway to a much more green economy future. Um, various uh, frameworks available for us. We do know that many countries have already prepared their nationally determined considerations. Uh, they are elements where we've had an opportunity to address adaptation, of course, to look at mitigation, uh, but very centrally for Africa, uh, to look at uh, recovery that focuses also on agriculture and clean energy policies and the interaction between energy, food, water, you know, the whole nexus in terms of seeing the, the, the interrelationships uh, between those sectors. Uh, clean energy, uh, which is really part of, um, uh, you know, the Paris Agreement, uh, Article 7, talks about the need to balance mitigation and adaptation. And we are not looking for sophisticated responses. Uh, we are looking for responses that really address the very need uh, of our communities. And that image is exemplary of what we require in our rural areas. Uh, clean energy, uh, when, of course, coupled uh, with a solution-based approach that deals with the very needs of our agricultural communities or our farmers out there to ensure that they are able to dry, to store, um, and to get their produce to the markets in a healthy state is basically what we are looking for and not necessarily uh, sophisticated elements. So a combination of looking at how we can combine good soils, uh, good approaches to farming, but combining it with clean energy would ensure you know, that the, we are uh, leading to increase yields and of course improve livelihoods uh, within the African continent. And of course, while 90% of the Africans are in the informal sector, operating outside the mainstream banking system, we are also looking at a combination where we address uh, and look at innovative financing mechanisms uh, that would allow increased access uh, for these resources. I will not go on to that, but I just want to look at a policy framework. So a finance policy that addresses the needs, whether it's agriculture or transport uh, needs and clean energy, but also looking at a, a clean energy policy that responds uh, to the very needs of our continents and combining uh, renewables, but also looking at micro, um, uh, micro grids but also, also national standard bodies playing a significant role. I do not want to preempt the whole issue of nature-based solutions and initiatives as part of the adaptation response, uh, but also the need for policy harmonization, et cetera. And in conclusion, I'd just like again to highlight with an African proverb, a bridge in Africa a lot of times is only prepared when someone falls into the water. And I think we're really talking about the importance of us mitigating risk but also having the preparedness through multilateral and intergovernmental processes, but also at national level, having robust policies and national develop, uh, determined considerations that really address both the adaptation uh, and the mitigation side of things. Thank you very much, Heidi.
Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, for that uh, excellent presentation and, and sharing uh, with us these wise African proverbs. Uh, uh, thank you. And also to reminding us uh, very importantly that inaction is never an option. That's a very important uh, message that you have given. And, um, and uh, like many previous speakers, linking the um, energy uh, uh, options to job creation and, and youth. Um, thank you also for sharing the information on this important report that UNEP has done. And I think that uh, as we didn't have a chance to really focus on the details of that report, if you are uh, willing, that would be an interesting report to share in the, in the chat function if that is available. Now it's uh, my great pleasure to invite Mr. Amjad uh, Abashar, the head of UNDRR's uh, regional office for Africa to uh, make a presentation and uh, uh, to you Amjad, I'd like to ask what is the progress made and the main challenges encountered towards achieving the targets of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction in African LDCs, which is a very important part of the challenges that uh, African LDCs are facing. Uh, Amjad, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Director, and, uh, and a, a warm thanks. Also, um, it's a pleasure for me to be with the Honourable Ministers today, and uh, thank you for hosting this. A special thanks to Malawi also for kindly hosting this important event. Um, the, the Sendai framework, I mean, uh, it really is an important uh, uh, blueprint for disastrous reduction. Uh, it's the first of the post-2015 agreements that took place uh, prior to the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. Its overall goal is really is to prevent new and reduce existing uh, disaster, uh, risk, uh, disaster risk. Um, it does so through um, uh, providing guidance uh, under uh, four headings or four priorities uh, related to uh, risk governance, uh, risk knowledge, uh, investment as well as uh, um, uh, building back better. And as you said, uh, Madam Director, it's, uh, it's about, it has seven targets which countries are supposed to uh, meet uh, by the end of, uh, by 2030. Now, I want to focus my intervention really on three particular areas. One of them is um, the, the issue of uh, risk governance, uh, followed by some um, intervention, a small intervention on uh, risk uh, knowledge and, uh, and, and also investment and financing for disaster risk reduction. Now, 90% of, uh, of um, disasters that are happening around the world and in Africa in particular are really climate related uh, events. So it's critical that uh, um, countries uh, ensure that disaster risk reduction strategies and climate, uh, climate uh, adaptation approaches or agendas or strategies are complementary or coherent. Uh, the first target that uh, countries are supposed to meet of the all of the seven targets of the Sendai uh, framework is to develop a disaster risk reduction strategies. Um, I mean, there has been satisfactory, uh, satisfactory progress made in, in Africa, in particular the area where, where I'm uh, based, uh, where we have 15 LDCs already in Africa that are already reporting on their national strategies. However, um, the, the financing of these strategies and the implementation of these strategies still face uh, a, a lot of challenges, obviously due, mostly due to capacity constraints. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, thank you very much. I was just talking about uh, the importance of having the, um, uh, the links between climate risk and disaster risk and the importance of not separating. They're, they overlap in many ways. They overlap in terms of budgets uh, that governments have and they overlap, of course, in terms of substance. So uh, we have been working here in UNDRR to support countries to develop uh, uh, coherent strategies by integrating climate change into the, our, our strategies or vice versa. However, we do have uh, some challenges that we often face when it comes to these uh, uh, processes. Uh, first of all, um, we know we, we, we discovered that there's still a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, even though there's a lot of common ground between disaster risk reduction approaches and climate change adaptation, um, there is still, a, 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 I would say, I would say a sort of a lack of cooperation, uh, not intentional, but certainly lack of cooperation, lack of communication ac across the sectors. And that's important to ensure that we have strong governance sy systems between disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation practitioners, because that's the only way we can uh, uh, you know, uh, ensure long-term resilience. And also, as I mentioned earlier, there needs to be um, a discussion on how to invest uh, and, and support uh, the disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation through um, uh, adequate budgets. Um, on the next slide, um, I wanted to quickly move on to the issue of, uh, of uh, risk knowledge. We have uh, a lot of countries in Africa do not have um, disaster loss databases that enable them to actually understand where the risk rise and have a historical understanding of where disasters occur. Um, you know, data has shown, uh, global data has shown that we actually have about two disasters a week in Africa, which is quite a lot. Some of them are intensive, some of them are extensive, so you don't always hear about it, but they are recorded. But we don't have national recording uh, uh, databases that are sufficient enough to enable uh, uh, risk-informed investments in the future. So uh, one of the ways that we're trying to work with countries is to, to, uh, to develop uh, probabilistic disaster risk profiles on floods and droughts. And we've done about 16, work with 16 countries that you see on the list there that have uh, worked uh, to develop these risk profiles. And uh, they're important in the sense that they can also inform the national disaster risk reduction strategies because you have to have a risk assessment to understand your risk before you're able to apply a strategy. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, I'll just go over quickly some of the importance of the, um, the important ways to apply risk profiles. Uh, first of all, they do enhance risk awareness. They can increase policy coherence. You'll understand, uh, uh, you know, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, climate change approaches and disaster risk reduction. They're important to support development planning uh, and climate adaptation uh, plans. And they can also be used uh, to uh, inform uh, land use and urban planning because they give you an idea uh, these risk uh, profiles can give you an idea of where the risk may occur 50 years and even 100 years in the future through a probabilistic uh, model that we provide. Now, in the next slide, uh, linked to the risk profiles, we also carried out these uh, budget reviews in the 16 countries to understand better how, how much money, if at all, is going into, or how much percentage of national budgets is actually going into disaster risk reduction. So our survey and our reviews uh, in cooperation with the 16 countries I mentioned showed that the direct, direct investment in disaster risk reduction is really uh, not more than 1% of a country's budget uh, on average. Uh, if we can count indirect disaster risk reduction investment, that figure goes up to four. But so there's still a lot of work uh, to ensure that we actually uh, mainstream uh, disaster risk activities in our, in our uh, models. Um, on the next slide, just to highlight some of the key challenges the, that I've uh, sort of alluded to, um, we still don't have enough access to uh, budget related data when it comes to how much money is going to disaster risk reduction. So some political support is needed in that, uh, uh, in that sense. The, secondly, um, there's very clear, uh, uh, not strong enough collaboration. I would like to just collaboration. kindly ask you to uh, conclude in about one minute. Yes, okay. So there's also the issue of collaboration across sectors, and uh, it's important to, uh, to ensure that we are able to do, get all the sectors and authorities in the government uh, working together. Uh, on the last slide, um, I just wanted to leave you with just a few messages. Uh, important to uh, recommendations to ensure a whole of government, uh, whole of society approach to ensure that uh, the coherent development of uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change strategies. Uh, it's also important to strengthen uh, the dialogue among the ministries of finance and planning, as well as DRR and CCA structures and also to um, ensure that national statistics offices play their role in terms of uh, collecting disaster uh, loss data and supporting governments uh, in having a hub for that uh, data. So thank you, Madam Director, for the time.
uh, I end there. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation and uh, the focus uh, on the importance of DRR work. I think when you mentioned that we have uh, two disasters a week on the African continent, uh, this really um, uh, uh, brings uh, into our mind uh, uh, the importance of the work that you are doing. I think the themes that you have mentioned, risk governance, risk knowledge and risk financing is very much the same themes that come through in, in all of these different uh, uh, discussions that we are having today. So <clears throat> I would really, uh, from my heart, thank uh, you panelists for your excellent contributions. I think that they have uh, given us a great way uh, to move forward to our interactive discussion. And um, we are now uh, uh, very privileged to have uh, excellent uh, lead discussions that will uh, take the floor. And it's my great honor and, and, and pleasure uh, to uh, invite the Honorable uh, Jean Capata, MP, Minister of Lands and Natural Resources uh, of Zambia uh, to take the floor. Uh, Madam Minister, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, your excellencies, Distinguished panelists, allow me to congratulate my colleague ministers from Malawi for hosting this very important meeting. I'm also delighted to be part of this important discussion on building resilience and accelerating the energy transition in least developed countries. As we all know, these developed countries face a range of pressures and challenges that undermine the economic and social development efforts and their achievement of all the sustainable development goals. Climate change is the most serious present day threat to human and nat natural system globally and adds to these already existing pressures. It is a threat multiplier tied to almost every major environmental and uh, developmental uh, challenge the world faces. Africa is home to 33 of the 46 LDPs and as such, building climate resilience and accelerating the energy transition in the, Africa, in the African LDCs must be a top priority. Adopting for climate change has become an essential component of any planning process, processes in all countries, particularly in the LDCs. For the LDCs and other vulnerable countries, climate change adaptation is a matter of survival of our vulnerable communities and fragile economies. While there is some progress towards improving energy efficiency and expanding access to electricity globally, significant deficits are increasingly concentrated in the sub-Saharan Africa. Energy access in Africa LDCs remain low as less than 30%. Therefore, stepped up efforts are required to enable universal energy access and accelerate the transition to renewable energy and energy efficiency in all the LDCs. Globally and within LDCs, we, are not, we now have a good understanding of climate change, risk, and potential adaptation solutions. In fact, while the LDCs remain vulnerable, they are the champions of adaptation to climate change, addressing the most complex issues of our time, starting with national adaptation programs of action developed 20 years ago. We therefore have a solid ground to create enhanced support mechanisms for the LDCs to scale up their work on climate change adaptation and therefore uh, strengthen resilience. Presently, all LDCs are putting in place their first national adaptation plans that will pave way for tracking medium and long-term adaptation needs of the LDCs. It is therefore crucial and to ensure that each one is supported to make these plans operational and implement concrete adaptation actions. Coming from uh, an LDC country, Zambia, myself, climate change has uh, adversely affected our energy security until a month ago, my country, which relies heavily on hydropower, generated electricity 
uh, experienced serious energy deficit due to reduced water levels in our reservoirs, which meant rationing power supplied to our communities. In some cases, this meant households and businesses going without power for up to 12 hours in a day. However, government has worked hard to increase the ratio of other renewable energy sources, particularly solar, in our energy mix. Coupled with the good rain season that we have experienced this year, this has resulted in normal generation and load shedding as the, as the rationing of the power was known and has, it has now ended. The COVID-19 pandemic has clearly demonstrated that the collapse of the global supply chain system largely crippled the weakest in the system. The LDCs for managing the situation in recovery efforts and jumping to the new ways of development. COVID-19 has also taught us that resilience on external systems and products is not only unsustainable, but uh, present unprecedented challenges. With the restriction in travel, all the support that could have been possible through external experience is not practical. The LDCs must therefore be supported to build long-term capacity and systems. In my own conclusion, Zambia would have, we, we, we had a strike, we had to strike a delicate balance in ensuring we protect our population from the COVID pandemic. At the same time, we ensured the wheels of the economy continued running to avoid a total collapse of the economy. Therefore, it did not have a total shutdown and indication are that we may soon be turning the corner. As I conclude my remarks, I wish to emphasize that being the most vulnerable, the LDCs must remain a priority under the UN system and the development community to enable them catch up with the rest of the world. A unified UN-led support system with special programs per region to support the LDCs to address climate change is critical. Therefore, efforts must be elevated to support all African LDCs to support human assets diversify their economies and build resilience to, pre to present to present and future shocks, to present, sorry, future shocks and uh, to achieve the goals of the 2030 agenda, as well as the Africa agenda 2063. While the COVID-19 pandemic is the most urgent threat facing humanity today, we cannot forget that climate change is the biggest peril confronting civilization over the longer Team. In fact, uh, climate change, uh, climate action through the implementation of the Paris Agreement will not only address uh, climate change, but help the world build forward from COVID-19 and other shocks we are yet to encounter. I thank you most sincerely all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for that excellent presentation. Your message is so clear. The, the international community, the UN system, and all of our partners must focus on LDCs. And I think that uh, the opportunity for, for this LDC5 conference is really there to, uh, to garner the, the support and build the further partnerships because more needs to be done. It's absolutely clear. And thank you also for your very strong message um, describing through uh, Zambians, Zambia's own experience on the on, on the importance of of, uh, of the, the the challenges of climate change, and and your um, view that climate resilience and adaptation strategies and energy actions really should be some of the key priorities uh, for the new program of action that needs to be uh, that need to be addressed. So thank you very much uh, for that, honourable minister. Now it's my great uh, honor and pleasure uh, to invite Honorable uh, Mohapi Mohapinyane, Minister of Energy and Meteorology uh, of Lesotho, um, to take the floor. Honorable Minister, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Moderator, uh, Excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, moderator, for giving me the floor. At the outset, I wish to indicate that Lesotho, like other LDCs, remains committed and at the top of action in championing climate action and accelerating energy transition. 
The least developed countries, LDCs, face a range of pressures and challenges that undermine their economic and social development efforts and their achievement of all the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Climate change is the most serious present day threat to human and natural systems globally and adds to these pressures. In Lesotho, extreme weather events have increased in frequency and magnitude resulting in loss of lives and property. Access to climate finance to increase resilience to climate change, impacts and reduce greenhouse emission remains a challenge in Lesotho, like in many other LDCs. In our effort to strengthen resilience and adoptive capacity to climate-related hazards and natural disasters, Lesotho prepared a National Adaptation Program of Action, NAPA, in 2007, which outlined priorities to build resilience and reduce the vulnerability of people of Lesotho to climate change impacts. Moderator, the Government of Lesotho Development the National Strategic Development Plan, NSDP2, with the objective of achieve, achieving climate resilience and low carbon development, as well as increasing access to sustainable energy. In 2017, Lesotho formulated the National Climate Change Policy and National Climate Change Policy Implementation Strategy and Sustainable Energy Strategy. The, the policy's long-term vision is to build a climate change resilience and low carbon pathways, including a prosperous, sustainable economy and environment in Lesotho. In June 2018, Lesotho submitted her updated nationally determined contributions NDC report to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, committing to unconditionally lower her net greenhouse gas emissions by 10% by 2030. To further push for an additional 25% greenhouse gas emission reduction on condition that external support in finance, investment, technology, development and transfer and capacity building is made available to cover the full cost of implementing the adaptation and mitigation actions. Furthermore, there are several initiatives and programs implemented by the government of Lesotho to address climate change, such as integrated catchment management, the improvement of early warning system, the formulation of a national adaptation plan, the improving adoptive capacity of vulnerable and put insecure populations in Lesotho, as well as mainstreaming climate change into our development programs. Moderator, turning to energy for Lesotho, like many other LDCs, access to is relatively low for the 9% household connections. Almost all electricity generated locally comes from hydro energy, which is highly dependent on the availability of good rains. With ongoing climate change, Lesotho is experiencing increased frequency and intensity of droughts, which exert pressure on hydropower generation. To address the, challenge, the energy challenges, Lesotho has developed the electrification master plan in order to accelerate electricity access. The Lesotho Solar Thermal Technology Roadmap to promote solar thermal applications and established the Lesotho Electricity Generation Company to improve electricity generation through renewable energy sources. In addition to this, there are ongoing and pipeline activities aimed at accelerating the clean energy transition in Lesotho, such as solar street lighting and the Lesotho Renewable Energy and Energy Access Project and the Sustainable Energy for All project. COVID-19, Pandemic has clearly demonstrated that the collapse of the global supply chain systems disproportionately crippled the weakest in the system, the LDCs. It has also taught us that reliance on external systems and products is not only unsustainable, but also presents unprecedented challenges. With the restrictions on travel, all the support that have been possible through external experts expertise is no longer accessible. In this instance, the moderator, we call on, we call on our development partners to support long-term capacity development in LDCs in order to build resilience to climate change. 
again in an effort to ensure that LDCs are better positioned to build resilience to climate change and natural disasters. Lesotho wishes to recommend that. As the most vulnerable, the LDCs must remain a priority under the UN system and the development community to enable them to catch up with the rest of the world. A unified UN-led support system with special programs per regions to support the LDCs to address climate change and energy shortage should be put in place. We consider the establishment of a UN Technology Bank for the LDCs one of the first achievements of the SDG target, target 7.8, that would help strengthen science and technology innovations essential to development, and therefore we call on the donor countries to support the UN Technology Bank so that it can execute its mandate to LDCs successfully. Efforts must be elevated to support all African LDCs to build human assets, diversify the economies, and build resilience to present and future shocks, improving access and simplifying modalities for climate finance and requisite conditionalities will ensure that countries like Lesotho are on the track to maintaining a climate resilient and low carbon pathway, thus bringing the attainment of the SDGs within reasonable reach. With these few remarks, I wish to, uh, to thank everyone for their attention and that's the end of our speech as Lesotho, Madam Moderator, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for that excellent presentation. Really interesting to hear the, the, uh, uh, the focus on the climate change and building resilience, and also how Lesotho has set up your climate change resilience and low carbon strategy. And also importantly, that you have mainstreamed your, uh, these strategies into your development plan. I think that is very important for, for us, uh, for, for that to be, those to be effective. That's excellent. And also, um, I really hear your call on these broad partnerships, so having development partners north and south uh, uh, at the widest possible uh, to come and support the LDCs. I also thank you for putting forward those uh, very concrete recommendations, uh, that that is excellent, and as we are looking into the uh, uh, the, the conclusions of this uh, 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 meeting uh, 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 and, and, and what the recommendations are, this is very, very useful. And I hear from you as well as the Minister of Zambia that the importance of keeping LDCs in the forefront of the UN agenda, that is important. And um, the, uh, it is clear that LDC 5 conference uh, uh, next January in Doha uh, will be a key moment for the international community to come together and to discuss what are the priorities, how can we uh, build back better after COVID, and what does it mean in concrete terms uh, for the LDCs, and how can uh, uh, the wider uh, partnerships be built to really help uh, uh, LD all LDCs reach the SDG goals as well. So thank you uh, very much for that uh, presentation. Now it is my great honor and, and pleasure to invite the Honorable Anansi Tempo, MP Minister of uh, Forest and Natural Resources of Malawi. Uh, Madam Minister, you have the floor. Madam Moderator, uh, fellow ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my presentation will focus on the question for UNEP, which is in two parts. Uh, I'll break it down. The first part will be broken down into five uh, parts. And the question is, policy and interventions required to meet adaptation challenges to climate change facing Africa over the next decade include Developing implementable national adaptation plans. As most developing countries, African developing countries, LDCs are participating in the national adaptation plan, but also formulating their plans, it will be important to utilize this process to prioritize our adaptation needs and develop implementable NAPs. In Malawi, the National Adaptation Plan process 
is currently underway. The NAB will identify medium and long-term adaptation priorities for the country and contribute to long-term community and ecosystem resilience. Our NAP will focus on agriculture, energy, forestry, wildlife, tourism, and human health sectors. Availability of local and international finances and mainstreaming of adaptation actions in the national and sectoral plans strategies will be critical to support strong implementation of these frameworks. The second part is mobilization and provision of dedicated climate finance for adaptation and resilience building. We are aware that for most of our nations, our climate resilience investment areas are well outlined and prioritized in our various strategic frameworks. But the challenge remains dedicated adaptation financing to implement these programs. Here in Malawi, in an effort to harmonize climate change management, we have established a national climate change fund so that it serves as a national basket for implementation of various climate related projects. However, capitalization of the fund is still a challenge, although the ministry is working tirelessly to access domestic resources through the national budget and related levies and taxes. For instance, the government has introduced a carbon levy on fuel. This levy is part of our domestic uh, mobilization of resources. And it signifies a political commitment towards climate change mitigation and adaptation in our economically constrained country. Additionally, we're working towards improving our capacity to access finance from multilateral climate financing mechanisms such as the Green Climate Fund through various sectoral trainings and accreditation of our national level organization to serve as executing partners of the GCF remains a challenge. I believe these same challenges are applicable to most of the LDC's countries. The third one is investing meaningfully into adaptation and is resilient action in local communities whilst taking into consideration nature-based solutions. We need to imp implement adaptation and resilience actions which are responding to urgent needs of the local communities. As the LDCs, we have to ensure that the national and the international climate finances should reach down to the local communities so that there are adaptive and resilient our capacity is improved. I encourage fellow front-runner countries for the LDC's uh, initiative for effective adaptation and resilience, life air, to take this initiative as an opportunity for meaningful investments to enable building climate resilience in local communities. One of the principles of this initiative is that at least 70% of the climate funds should be spent on local communities where climate impacts are most felt. Fourthly, establishing strong and meaningful local, bilateral, and multilateral uh, partnerships and strengthening them where they already exist. Strong partnerships will facilitate transfer of finance, technology, and techno technical expertise as we are dealing with devastating impacts of climate change. The partnerships have to start with strong engagement with the local communities where they should be actively involved in the planning and implementation of adaptation initiatives so that they are not left behind. The international partnerships are also very critical considering that climate change is a global problem. Malawi has partnered with the governments of the UK, Netherlands, Egypt, Bangladesh, and St. Lucia to champion climate resilience and adaptation strand under the United Nations Coalition on Adaptation. Through this initiative, we are confident that we will be able to steer Malawi to become a climate resilient nation where adaptation is placed at the core of national planning decision-making processes. 
The initiative will ensure urgent action is taken to protect our people, economies, and the environment, and that no person is left behind in addressing the impacts of climate change that our country is grappling with. The last part of the first part of the question is promoting alternative sources of, of energy. Among the pressing issues in our communities mm -hmm. is over reliance on biomass for cooking, which is resulting into rampant deforestation. To deal with this uh, problem, emphasis has been to, to deal with this problem, emphasis has to be made on providing alternative sources of energy to local communities. For example, through the use of LPG, solar, briquettes, and biomass. And I must add that uh, we are currently working with the Ministry of Energy to, as a matter of agency, identify alternative uh, sources of energy. We realize that this far we have made effort, but they've been really piecemeal and really not uh, covering the entire breadth of the country. So the Ministry of Energy is currently now working to come up with an alternative that can be used throughout the country. And the last part of the question is barriers and enablers to accessing adaptation funding for enhancing resilience. The barriers, the most I think important barrier is limited local expertise to develop quality project concepts and funding proposals to meet the standards required by the bilateral and the multilateral funding instruments. There is financing out there, but for us uh, to be able to access that has been a challenge because the lack of expertise on the ground. And what we're doing now is accessing fund, funds to develop that local capacity. And of course, there is the bureaucratic and stringent procedures to access that climate fund. The third one will be uh, the top-down approach, where funding agents have conceived priority thematic areas to be supported without input from the local communities. Like I said earlier on, we have to involve the local communities in planning and implementing. And the, when we, we are putting together the uh, approaches to funding, Oftentimes, these the procedures are important imposed on us. We have to start from the bottom to the top in order to make it less cumbersome for countries to access this funding. And I will thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, for that excellent presentation of, of Malawi's uh, national adaptation plans, focusing really on the issues of climate change and, and uh, the same themes again uh, are coming up, access to financing, <clears throat> the need for capacity training, setting up uh, relevant policies and the importance of partnerships as you have described and very interesting to hear the kinds of partnerships that you in, in Malawi uh, have already set up for you. Uh, thank you for that very, very uh, interesting presentation. Now it's my Great pleasure to invite Mr. Brian Dean, uh, who is the lead of energy efficiency and cooling, uh, sustainable from uh, Sustainable Energy for All. Brian, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much, and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure listening to all of the uh, all the speakers so far. Um, I hope I can bring a, an interesting and different angle um, as the head of energy efficiency at Sustainable Energy for All, which is you know, what we need energy for is the services that they provide, including supporting resilience through nutrition, health, comfort, and, and human safety. And as we do our planning and we do our uh, uh, investment uh, decisions, um, our efforts are really pushing towards looking for solutions that first reduce the need for energy, and then uh, investing in those solutions that uh, deliver sustainable renewable energy to meet those energy needs. And as head of energy efficiency, you know, I, I really here to talk a lot about the energy efficiency angle of this and uh, energy efficiency can enable, you know, that gigawatt of renewable energy that um, Mr. Wanless spoke about, uh, that it can deliver many more services than uh, in a non 
energy efficient approach. Um, and energy efficiency solutions are really critical for both energy access and energy transition. Ghana is an interesting country which actually used energy efficiency to increase their energy access uh, dramatically um, over, over, a, over a decade really. Um, cooling is an interesting uh, example though of a cross sectoral issue where efficiency and renewables play a really important part together. And uh, you know, cooling supports health during this time of COVID. Uh, that's become uh, everybody's uh, number one attention. Of course, health, nutrition, productivity, education, and more. Cooling really supports a number of sectors, a number of our key development issues. Uh, energy efficiency measures like cool roofs, external shading, community cooling centers, and nature-based solutions, which we've heard for adaptation reasons. Nature-based solutions like trees can actually cool buildings, can make it easier for students to learn in a school, uh, can, uh, when, when placed properly within a city, can ensure that uh, distribution of vaccines can make it from point A to point B without temperatures rising too, too high. Uh, risk planning efforts are also really a big part of this, really happy to hear that earlier as well. Local heat action plans uh, should be part of this risk planning effort in addition to national cooling action plans. So, you know, we, we see that energy efficiency solutions are really essential to the least cost path, um, whether they're technology solutions, services solutions, like a community cooling center, a policy solution like heat action plan or a regulation, or a financial solution like a pay as you go model. Um, you can actually follow, uh, at SC for All, we have a campaign on this uh, for our cooling effort. Uh, called This Is Cool. And you, you can find that on our website, scprawl.org, or through social media if you look for hashtag This Is Cool, um, including some that we've been working for uh, on the COVID-19 side. Uh, in terms of our partners, uh, one I'd like to highlight that's working in uh, some of the LDCs in Africa, in addition to other countries in Africa, is the Million Cool Roof Challenge, uh, working in Nigeria, Rwanda, and Senegal in particular. Um, in addition to a few, few others, that effort is actually looking to deliver what is a really cost-effective way of delivering that service, as I mentioned in the beginning. We also see that the um, high-level dialogue on energy, which will um, be in the fall, will be an important moment to uh, develop what are called energy compacts. Within those energy compacts, we also think it's an opportunity to uh, examine both the energy transition and the energy access um, uh, measures. And uh, certainly I hope that energy efficiency will be a really big part of that, uh, as I'm sure that Irina really wants renewables to be a big part of that as well. So uh, I think that's it for me. Um, back over to you, um, Madam Moderator. Um, uh, thank you very much for those uh, very important uh, remarks and, and really uh, again focusing on the broad impact that uh, energy access has on the society, be it human, economic, environmental, it really has an impact on, on the whole society and the whole spectrum of, of, of the development and the developmental trajectory of, an, of a country and absolutely key uh, for all of the LDCs and thank you also for sustainable energy for all for being such an important partner to many of the LDCs. Uh, uh, thank you for being uh, with us. Now next, uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to uh, Mr. David Jackson, representing the UNCDF Capital Development Fund. Uh, David, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much indeed, Chair, and thank you so much indeed to colleagues and uh, honorable uh, participants. I, I would like to make um, two very specific uh, points, I think, uh, uh, which I believe we should make sure are minuted into the uh, results of, 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 of our deliberations as part of this regional review and, and taken forwards. The first one was very well spoken by a number of the speakers, which is the, the need for direct access to climate finance by the least developed countries in Africa. And here I say direct access because Yes, there are lots of projects around, but climate finance and climate adaptation in particular for Africa ne needs to be something which is mainstreamed and baked into the global financial system. The, um, you know, we'll see at this year's COP, but the scientists, as we all know, acknowledge now that we will, it's highly unlikely, probably impossible to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
Uh, we need to live for a different uh, future and we will need to, we've always adapted as people to live on the planet and we're now going to need to step up our game in terms of adapting to a hostile climate, which will affect our water quite significantly, our land use, uh, the way that we can build uh, our cities. It will need baked in institutional architectural features, not just projects. And fortunately, the government of Malawi, actually, through 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 the representative of um, Perks uh, Legoya at the United Nations, the PR, is the chair of the local climate adaptive living facility, which has 22 countries, LDCs. Um, and it, it, its purpose is to secure direct access to the Green Climate Fund and other vertical sources of climate finance that can deliver locally adapt uh, through national systems through local government uh, transfers, through local chambers of commerce, through national systems, but reports globally. So the, I think the management and delivery locally, the reporting globally, it enables that aggregation. And this mechanism, um, which is managed by the LDCs, actually is very effective because it's not a project. So you don't have to buy the vehicles, have the hire the project managers, set up a whole parallel structure. Instead, you plug it in to your national adaptation system and it enables direct access to green climate fund and others. So the local climate adaptive living facility, I believe it, it, it can be part of the way forwards. It's all, it has four ambassador countries, Ghana, uh, uh, Gambia, Mozambique, and uh, Niger and the ministers of environment of those countries are also working towards COP and, and to get it embedded in the LDC 50 agenda, as mentioned uh, earlier. So that's one thing I wanted to put on the table. And uh, I think it's a good initiative that's led by the LDCs. The second one is the International Municipal Investment Fund. So this is a fund which is being established now. It will be capitalized this year. It's managed by Meridium in Paris. It's a private sector fund, but, and the big but is, its exclusive purpose is to invest in developing country cities and this kind of urban resilient infrastructure through long-term vehicles that can be co-financed with on, on domestic stock exchanges, with, with domestic banks, to kind of try to provide this kind of long-term infrastructure finance that is needed, uh, because we know it's long-term finance to address some of these issues that have been uh, mentioned. And um, again, I understand that we're working with our team on uh, waste on a couple of waste to energy projects in Blantyre and uh, Lilongwe. Uh, uh, in, 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 in Malawi in particular where, uh, for, for this uh, op op operation. But um, the, the bigger purpose here is that I think it's, um, it's, it, it's an ex we need to have these architectural features again in terms of investment funds that work with governments, but free up this sub-national space. Uh, a government cannot borrow on its sovereign guarantee sufficient for the investment required and on its own the private sector cannot come in just on its own there needs to be a blend and a freeing up of the sub-sovereign space and that's what this fund and other initiatives are doing uh, i'm pleased to say we're working with chef, chef Schwen in morocco for example on, on a similar street lighting project kumasi ghana on a light rail system a number of other investments so to conclude, the Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility, an LDC-led initiative for direct access to the Green Climate Fund, the International Municipal Investment Fund, which is coordinated the technical assistance facility through United Nations, uh, UNCDF, and other agencies we're working with can provide a pipeline of investment projects. But all of this will be key to creating the investment ecosystem to address the policy issues that have been uh, I mentioned and uh, including at this year's COP. So thank you so much indeed, colleagues. And uh, adaptation will have to be a feature of LDC5 uh, as will uh, in transformational investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for that imp very important uh, 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 discussion on, uh, you know, uh, finance adaptation and, and uh, uh, adaptation finance and, uh, and really uh, providing us with uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, 
information on uh, financial existing financial uh, instruments that are important for the LDCs. And uh, thank you also for being with us. Uh, UNCDF is, of course, an, a, a really important partner, uh, focusing really only on the LDCs. Uh, so very important partner uh, for us and, and for all, all, the, all the LDCs. Now it's my great pleasure to give the floor to uh, uh, the distinguished representative of Sierra Leone, Aminata Sidique of Mauritius. Uh, Ms. Sidike, can you please unmute? If you are talking, uh, you are muted, so unfortunately we cannot hear you. It looks like we don't have the... Um, opportunity I'm looking at my uh, uh, technical team uh, whether they have um, a, um, a possibility I would now like to give the floor as we are waiting for Ms. Siddique to give the floor to Mr. Uh, 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 Mamadou Dia or from Senegal you have the floor Merci bien uh... Madame la directrice Heidi, euh, je voudrais remercier tous les, euh, les, les panélistes et vous dire comment c'est important aujourd'hui de, de penser au développement des, des énergies renouvelables à, et l'adaptation au, au changement climatique. Au Sénégal, nous, aujourd'hui, euh, on est à 22% en termes de production par rapport aux énergies renouvelables sur la production totale d'énergie et l'objectif c'est d'arriver en 2024 à, à 30% et à 50% en, en 2030. Mais on sait que dans nos pays les, pays les moins avancés, l'une des contraintes structurelles c'est surtout l'accès à l'énergie et l'accès à l'électricité. Nous avons au, au niveau des paiements les taux d'accès à l'énergie les, les plus faibles, surtout l'électricité. Et, que nous, et également les coûts, les coûts d'accès à l'électricité aussi les plus élevés, ce qui peut sembler euh, paradoxal. Et si maintenant nous voulons aller vers le renforcement de la productivité et de la compétitivité des économies des PMA et arriver surtout à une transformation structurelle euh, des économies, euh, le rôle et la place que l'accès à l'énergie doit, doit jouer. Et aujourd'hui, euh, euh, une question par rapport au représentant du, du PNIE qui avait parlé de, de, de l'accès. Euh, quelle stratégie peut pourrait être développée, non seulement pour permettre aux, aux pays les moins avancés de pouvoir combler le gap énergétique, mais d'avoir accès euh, à une énergie propre, mais à des coûts très, très, très faibles pour pouvoir euh, prétendre à cette transformation structurelle, mais surtout augmenter l'accès des populations à, à l'énergie. Je vous remercie. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dia, for your uh, 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 discussion on energy access and the importance of the affordability uh, also uh, of the clean energy and what the options uh, there are. And I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Senegal, because if I understand correctly, you have just been uh, recommended for the first, or you have met the LDC graduation criteria for the first uh, time. Uh, and that has happened just very recently. So I really uh, like to congratulate Senegal for, for that uh, in very important uh, milestone. Um, now, I would like, to, I think that um, we were not able to solve the communication problem that we had with uh, Sierra Leone, unfortunately. So now I would like to um, 
go back to the panelists uh, who are, are still with us and are, are um, uh, as you have heard, all the discussion, all the concerns. Um, if you could give us just one minute, one minute of any final um, ideas, conclusions, recommendations, the more concrete uh, you can be, uh, the better. Um, I would uh, really uh, like to hear from you any final reflections uh, from, uh, from this very interesting, really interesting and important panel that we have uh, had. And I uh, first would like to call on Mr. Uh, Francesco Lacanera, Director General of IRENA. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, a very been, it's been a very interesting the discussion. And uh, if I can uh, uh, conclude in, a, in one minute, uh, my main point uh, is uh, human resources are key in this exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, naturally, naturally the, the building of projects that has to be in the context of uh, a very well designed energy planning and what we are trying to do in supporting country in the uh, a new round of uh, NDC in their presentation. And uh, uh, I strongly uh, say encourage uh, countries uh, to, to send to, through the various platform of ARENA ideas for projects together with our partners over the Climate Investment Platform, we will try to make the possible matching from uh, projects and the financial resources needed. So this is the main message, trying to work. We are ready to work with you in all aspects and trying to, to go from the uh, planning to the, to the project and the real implementation and the changes needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Director General, and thank you uh, for being with us today and the important work uh, that Irina is doing and continues to do in, uh, in support of, of, of LDCs. Next, I would like to uh, invite uh, Mustafa Bakuri, President and CEO of the Moroccan uh, Agency for Sustainable Energy and co-lead for the Coalition for Sustainable Energy Access. Mr. Bakuri, uh, any final uh, 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 reflections? So, d'abord, pour féliciter tous les intervenants et pour la qualité de, 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 de l'intervention, des interventions qui viennent, à mon sens, pour résumer en quelques instants, qui viennent reconfirmer le consensus qui est, à mon avis, plus important que jamais sur la nécessité de, 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 de faciliter l'accès à l'énergie au PMA en particulier et surtout l'énergie durable, et qu'il n'y a pas de contradiction entre l'accès à l'énergie et la protection de, de l'environnement, et capitaliser sur le, les nombreuses initiatives. Euh, tout à l'heure, euh, évidemment, vu le temps, il n'a pas été possible de, rentrer dans, de mentionner certains, certaines initiatives très concrètes, euh, soit bilatérales, soit multilatérales. Je veux, je veux en citer deux sur l'Afrique euh, très brièvement. Le Desert to Power qui, qui concerne le, les pays du Sahel, Aujourd'hui, avec, euh, avec les cinq pays du Sahel, il y a des, des, des plans autour de certains projets très concrets, en particulier sur le solaire. Et une autre initiative avec la Banque islamique de développement, toujours sur l'Afrique, euh, des PMA africaines, où nous travaillons sur des projets très concrets. Pour dire que euh, ce, ce, aujourd'hui, le travail qui est fait au niveau de l'ONU va permettre de fédérer et faciliter les synergies entre ces différentes initiatives pour accélérer la, la mise en œuvre des, des programmes du pays par pays. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Bakuri, for uh, summarizing and, and, and for the important work that you are doing uh, in support of the LDCs. And, uh, and thank you very much uh, for being with us today. I would like to now uh, invite Eric Vanless from uh, uh, Rockefeller Foundation to give any one minute uh, uh, reflections that this uh, panel has uh, brought uh, into your mind. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Heidi. Um, to, to me, where we're at is we have the technology to, to do what needs to be done. We have the finance 
uh, to, to fund what needs to be done. And we have the partners to, to execute on what needs to be done. And so I, I think we're at a time where the foundation and our partners are, are very interested in, in getting very specific on, on making this happen in specific countries. And so I'm, 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 I'm uh, hopeful and, and uh, eager to, to get started and to, to continue the transition uh, in, in the countries that are, are most in need. Thank you very much, um, uh, Eric, for your reflections and uh, look forward to continuing uh, close collaboration uh, with you. And thank you for the important work uh, that you're doing and, and for being with us today. Um, next, uh, I would like to invite Cecilia Nyenga, head of South Africa Office of UNEP, Cecilia, uh, for any final reflections. Well, thank you very much, Modrisa, and thank you very much, ministers, and uh, especially Minister Tembo, um, for really calling on us and uh, uh, you know challenging uh, us as UNEP uh, in terms of intensifying our work. I see two possible opportunities. First, there is the opportunity where most of the LDCs will be reviewing uh, their NDCs. Uh, what I have noticed in my review of uh, various NDCs uh, within the Africa continent is that they have extremely broad goals. I think we do have the opportunity of uh, refining and making them more integrated, as I said, to look at the nexus issues. So how can we uh, leverage uh, from our mitigation actions uh, where we are moving towards expanding uh, to much more clean energy uh, and leverage those to address our agriculture uh, challenge, et cetera. I think secondly, where the gap is, we have lots of proliferation of good policies in our countries where we are lacking is basically on the implementation gap. And again, is moving uh, from very broad stated goals uh, to actual small, even if we call them small bits, uh, but biteable bits uh, where we can be able to leverage uh, and moving on to the financing question, uh, seeing how we can integrate uh, investment tools uh, that can really respond to our various needs. Uh, the agricultural sector in many of our LDCs is mainly practiced by small scale farmers. How can we leverage from nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based adaptation? Lots of the LDCs in this forum uh, and across Africa are members of UNEP's ecosystem-based adaptation uh, program. Uh, how can communal cooperatives also serve as a critical financing instrument uh, for either agriculture, for energy, for water. How can we leverage? Uh, many countries now do have policies for microgrids, um, finding the right investments uh, to channel and uh, energize uh, the microgrids in order for them to feed uh, and water Africa and LDCs in a better way. So I think those for me are two, the opportunity of the revision of NDCs and then strengthening our implementation frameworks where we can come uh, and, uh, and, and support you in terms of integrating both the mitigation and adaptation approaches. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for uh, that uh, important summary, and thank you for the excellent work that UNEP is doing in, in Africa, and in particular in this field of, uh, of climate and uh, climate resilience and, and, and energy. It is it's crucially important. Thank you very much uh, to you for being with us uh, today. Um, next, I would like to call uh, Mr. Amjad Bashar, uh, head of UNDR's regional office for Africa. Uh, for any final one-minute reflections. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director. Um, I mean, I just have a very short intervention. I think one of the things that we've learned in the disaster risk management community, particularly as a result of COVID-19, is to understand that, uh, that uh, we're now defining disaster risk reduction uh, we have to address the systemic risk behind it. And uh, everything seems to be cascading. They're all the, the work that we're talking about, all the discussions that we've had, they're very much are interlinked with each other and which we call systemic risk. And that's the root of the problem I think we need to address. And that requires really a whole of society approach, a multi-sectoral approach, and then we all have to work together to reduce risk and uh, ensure that LDCs are, are not accumulating risk and creating new risk as they develop uh, into the future. So that's just uh, my message to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, uh, important reflections. Uh, 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is really the last panel of this Africa Regional Review meeting, and I uh, uh, I would like to, uh, in this panel, at, uh, also really pay tribute to Malawi, our host, uh, in the way uh, they have conducted and put together uh, these meetings and, uh, and, and really the excellent setup and the quality of these uh, different uh, panels that we've had uh, uh, and, uh, and and really uh, thank you so much uh, Malawi for the, the excellent hosting and I have a great honor and pleasure to invite the two ministers uh, from Malawi uh, to give some closing reflections uh, uh, for, um, for our session and I would first uh, like to call upon Honorable Nancy Tembo, MP Minister uh, of Forest and Natural Resources of Malawi, just for a few minutes, because we have uh, still one more uh, coming up. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Um, this is uh, just to thank all the panelists and uh, all the speakers for this great occasion where we shared ideas uh, we can only build back better if we can uh, share the experiences of, uh, from other countries. And that's the only way we can strengthen our fight against the, uh, the climate, climate change and the effects that it brings. Uh, for Malawi, we uh, set for uh, to be a partner with our fellow APCs, LBC members, um, to work together, to plan together, and to strategize together. We are thankful for this opportunity and grateful for all the organizers of what they've put together and hope to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And now uh, for the uh, closing uh, remarks, I would like to uh, invite Honorable Newton Kambala, Minister of Energy uh, of Malawi. So you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Actually, I would like to sincerely thank you for uh, your asking uh, moderating this session. I sincerely would like to thank you on behalf of everybody. And I would also like to thank uh, uh, my colleague here, the Minister of Forest and Natural Resources in Malawi, Honorable Nancy Tembo MP, uh, for uh, her contributions and uh, also the rest of the ministers and the rest of the panelists uh, for the variable contributions. It has now become uh, very obvious that the, this discussion has become a good starting point uh, to enable us to uh, put our heads together uh, to continue brainstorming and uh, examining strategies and the best practices that uh, could help us to enhance energy resilience and energy transmission in Africa or uh, disease and Haiti in the uh, way to um, in the wake of the impact of the climate change in energy sector. It is also pleasing to note that uh, it is also pleasing to note that uh, we all agree that we should not leave anybody, not even a single household behind. And Malawi is therefore very pleased to take on a leadership a role as champion for energy access. And uh, I would want to wish everybody uh, well and a uh, good night uh, uh, for uh, those of us who are in the night. Thank you, Father. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Honorable Minister, for your kind words and the excellent summary that uh, you have had. And, and again, uh, our deep gratitude for your uh, hosting this meeting in such an excellent uh, manner. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, at this end of this uh, uh, panel, it is my great pleasure to, from my heart, thank all of the panelists. They have brought such important uh, uh, views into, um, into this discussion. And uh, there are just very few uh, uh, issues that I would like to highlight. It's clear that climate change is an increasing threat to African LDCs and has the potential to roll back for hard won economic gains due to their current low adaptive capacity. Despite the many challenges, LDCs have continued to show strong political leadership on climate action that came out very strongly in many of the minister's interventions. 
And uh, this is very much uh, consistent with the 1.5 uh, uh, pathways that we have committed to. There is an urgent need for the international community to scale up support directed towards building institutional capacity, improving coordination and addressing financial constraints to meaningfully implement national adaptation plans. An integrated approach to climate action, not just looking at climate ambition, but also the wider social economic benefits, environmental benefits, Investing in job creation and promoting equitable growth is key to long-term resilience building. Despite the extraordinary growth potential for the energy sector in LDCs, these countries rarely benefit from larger financing schemes to the same extent as others, more prosperous developing countries. Something needs to be done about this. We must seize opportunities to integrate energy transition as an in integral part of post-COVID recovery plans that can stimulate uh, economies as well as mitigate climate risks. Sustainable energy should therefore be one of the central thematic topics of the new 10-year program of action for LDC, which will be adopted at the fifth UN conference on the LDCs in 2022. So with that, those few reflections, um, I would once again like to thank the panelists, the ministers in particular who have been with us. Thank you so much. And all of you, each and every one, we've had a very good participation in this, uh, in this session. I thank you all for being there. And, and I hope that we can continue working together strongly on these issues on, in the pathway of the Doha. Uh, uh, conference in January 2022. With these words, I would like to close this session and invite you all to the high level closing session, which will start in just a few minutes at 10 a.m. New York time at five o'clock Malawi time. Thank you again and wishing you all a very good rest of the day. Thank you for being with us.